Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are joined by Steve Vincent, writer, teacher, author and spiritual coach with over 33 years of experience helping others overcome their challenges and leave their dharma. Steve is a public speaker, workshop facilitator and creator of Pen Dragon Men's Circle and Copywriters Escape Room Support Programs. He is a lover of sunsets and his search for the truth of our human existence has stretched from the sands of the Sunshine Coast to the hot springs of New Zealand to the Peruvian Amazon for ayahuasca ceremonies and has included many an energetic healing online and in person and long hours alone pondering the meaning of life. Steve started out as a high school teacher and became faculty head and vice principal and then moved into a freelance journalist copywriting uh, copywriter, writing coach and marketing consultant. His own journey has taken him inwards to unlock the pain of the human experience, which emerges in his words that are said to move women to tears and make men squirm. An experienced speaker, he has captivated audiences as large as 1,500 and coached groups of all ages and sizes. Steve is a father to four adult children and lives on the beautiful Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. And when he's not writing and mentoring others, he can be found at one of the beautiful local beaches, communing with Mother Earth or gazing out to sea. Steve's published a book called Finding You. And one of the reviews about his book is amazing. And it says, if you've ever felt the pain of disconnect from yourself, from those closest to you or from the world in general, then Steve Vincent's raw and authentic words are here to help. If you want to find true freedom to find you, then you're invited to take the journey into your shadow self. So on that note, please welcome our guest today, Steve Vincent. Hey, hello. Thanks. Thanks for being with us, Steve. Pleasure. So that's a little bit about you. But for those who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to where you are now? Yeah, look, I am I am so boringly normal, if I can put it that way. I grew up um, in Brisbane, the suburbs of Brisbane. Um, you know, we were a, a, a normal, average, lower middle class family. Um, I'm the youngest of six kids. We had a strong Catholic faith um, and I was given a script to follow. And that script was work hard at school, get good grades, go to university, get a good job and everything will be happy and everything will be great. Yeah. And I did that and I did that really, really well, but I wasn't happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, th and things weren't really great, you know? Um, and I guess I, I, I never really felt I fitted in in many ways. Um, and, you know, I, one of the things I've worked hard on, too, is, is not to, to project out and blame my upbringing for how I'm feeling. Um, yeah. You know, it, I can acknowledge that that's what happened and, and I followed it, but it just never really gelled with me. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm very good at teaching people, very good. So all of the things that I did that got me here have got me to this point. But it also was me in many ways not really being me. Um, yeah. And I, I've, I've spent decades, I think, unraveling that. You know, don't get me wrong, I have a very successful life. I have a beautiful wife, beautiful family. Uh, I live on the Sunshine Coast, which are very envious, you know, for, for many people. Yeah. You know, so it's not like things are bad, but in here, um, you know, things have been tough on occasions, you know, and life, life is, and I guess if you're an empathetic person as well, life can be difficult. And so I've spent, um, a long time unraveling that and, and I think one of the things too I have felt that all along but I've ignored that and I've put a mask in place pretending that everything is fine and you know you can squash that stuff those feelings down for so long but it comes back again and again and again and at some point you actually have to listen to that voice that comes from somewhere and take some action about that, right? Because, you know, it, it life is a journey, but the little tap on the shoulder that you get, that little voice, that little gnawing away, um, it does not go away. No. And so yeah. you either suffer in silence, mask in place, pretending, oh, hi, how are you going? Yeah, I'm really good. Or 
you do something about it. Yeah, and sometimes wearing the mask and being happy on the outside, but inside you know things aren't right. Sometimes that mask is just, it's easier than looking inside and doing the work so that you can live your full express self. Yeah. Um, so how did you get to where you are now? Like what was what was some of the work you did? Uh, I've done an awful lot of personal development stuff from, you know, the big Tony Robbins rah-rah type seminars to um, individual coaching to um, journeying with psychedelics, um, you know, ayahuasca in the Peruvian Amazon, which was uh, a very big experience. I've had energetic energy healings, um, journaling, breath work, um, cacao. It's almost like I'm this self-development junkie. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to own that. That's that's oh. fair enough. Um, but I've, and it, I guess it's like to us humans in my belief, us humans are like layers, right? And we we do one thing to reach a certain level. We peel a layer off. And then we have to do something else because that layer is now different and you're now a different person. So peeling another layer off and another layer off. So to me, it's a, it's been a journey of, I guess, self-discovery. And, and the hardest thing for me, I think, has been honest with myself at every step of the way. Because, you know, and you mentioned it and I said at the start too about it's just so much, so damn easy just to go mask in place here, everything's fine. Yeah. yeah. And that doesn't, that works for only so long. And, you know, yeah. you, you, you cannot be untrue to yourself, you know, for, well, I, I guess I did it for years, for decades, but oh. there will come a time when that gets to a point where you go, no, I've had enough of this. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I guess what, one of the things I'm describing there is the shadow self, you know, the, the Carl Jung, he said it best. He said, they don't carry the shadow. Uh, and the less it's embodied in the individual conscious life, the blacker and denser it becomes. He said, at all accounts, it forms an unconscious snag that thwarts our most well-meant intentions. Those are beautiful words. Yeah. You know, an unconscious snag. So if, you, if there is something stopping you being happy, if there's something, some glass ceiling, there's a good chance that there's, there's stuff shoved down in your shadow. So you have the person that you show the world and then you have this other side of yourself that's got all the stuff you don't want to show the world, you know, your shame, your embarrassment, your fears, um, where you feel small. And what he says is that if you ignore that stuff, that's just going to silently run your life and you basically yeah. will never be happy. You know, that's the key thing. Yeah, and, and I agree with that as well because you have that little voice in your head um, and if you suppress it and, and those feelings, those, those head, heart, gut feelings, you know, mm. You can logically know something, but then your if your heart felt or your gut's telling you, and yes. people ignore those signs of the heart mm. and the gut, but they're there for a reason. Mm. And our body mm. is telling us in different ways. And I love the fact that you talked about the little tap on the shoulder. Oh. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> go away, go away, go away, right? In my coaching, <laughs> I, I quite often use this analogy with um, with my clients is that, you know, the universe will send you a message and it'll give you a little feather, a little tickle, then a little tap. And it'll give you a slap, right? And then if you're really not listening, it'll send a truck yes. right? to yeah. just mow you down. Now, that can be emotionally, can be physically, can be both. And sometimes when people push themselves too hard and then they and they metaphorically and physically fall over, they, they don't understand why. But for me, I think that connection back to the shadow trying to give you a message that it's okay to be you, it's okay to live your full self, it's okay to accept and embrace and acknowledge that we aren't perfect, Mm. you know and that's okay and we do have those things that we might be fearful of or shameful of or guilty or whatever but if we don't process those emotions they're going to stay trapped and they're going to stop us from living our full lives so oh, 100%. why for you because you've written a lot more on this than I have why is shadow work important what does it what is the essence of doing the shadow work yeah so I'll probably I'll go back one step one of the problems or the difficulties the challenges with shadow work is that who wants to admit that they're petty they're nasty they're weak they have shames they have embarrassments they have guilt they have fears no one wants to admit that stuff right and so we don't look at it because it's uncomfortable 
I don't, want, I don't want to admit that I'm less than. I don't want to admit when I walk into a room, I feel this this small or this big, whichever way I'm feeling at the time. Um, you know, and Dr. David Hawkins, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but in the book, Letting Go, he, um, he said there's nothing unique about any of us. He said yeah. that um, when it comes to the way we symbolise our emotions, he said everybody secretly harbours the desire or the fear rather that they are dumb, ugly, unlovable and a failure. Um, you know, everyone has some version of that going on. I mean, I was I was so relieved when I read that, right? Because um, it was like, oh, thank God, it's not just me, right? Um, and so, the, the the thing why that's so important is that what, what, to get back to your question, why why shadow work is so important, right? Is because if you know, think of us like this. If this is the bright, shiny look, hey, look at me, I'm a good teacher, I'm a good speaker, blah 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 blah. Over here is, oh, you know, I feel dumb, I feel small, I feel weak, I feel challenged, I feel embarrassed. If I'm not looking at that part of me, I'm only accepting part of myself. Oh. And I can never be happy and I can never feel whole oh. because I'm not looking at both sides of me. It's only when I accept that I have all of those things, my pettiness, my shame, my guilt, my fears, it's only then that I can be like a whole person. Yeah. And you can only ignore yourself. Um, you know, for, for so much of the time um, because you, ignoring that part of you doesn't make you go, doesn't make it go away. You know, and, you, and I guess you can't find, um, you, you can't find true freedom because if, if you're ignoring your shadow, you're often always wearing a mask and wearing a mask is not freedom, right? It is, it yeah. is um, you pretending to be something that you're not. Yeah. And it's like yin and yang, it's the laws of polarity, isn't it? Totally. We can't have, you know, the sun without the moon. We can't have sunshine without the rain. Yeah. You know, you need a little rain to make a rainbow. So having those shadow selves and having those those fears, those, those little um, feelings of jealousy or um, pettiness or whatever, we all have them at some point in time. And if we suppress them, they probably grow more, whereas yeah. if we let them flow through us we've acknowledged that we've had that and now we've let it go so now we can open space for other things to come in but we are going to have ups and downs in life um because you can't stay up 100 percent of the time yeah no matter what tony robbins looks like he has to have down time. <laughs> <laughs> right? well, give, me, um, give me a high five for that right that man is just woof. Anyway, but he does, he does, he talks about his downtime and his meditations and what he does to reset and that those events do drain him if you listen to some of the things he says. So um, there, there is, I think there's freedom and acknowledging that we are all of those things. Yeah, and, and I think freedom and one, acknowledging them, but importantly, being okay with acknowledging them. Now, now I'll give you an example if I hadn't have done all the work and understood the shadow and, and gone into all of that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you would have got a very different version of me um, on a call like this. It wouldn't have been um, as raw and authentic. It would have been much more polished, um, you know, because I wanted you to see me as this wonderful speaker who was really, really intellectual and can really um, articulate things and really help people. Um, you know, I wouldn't have been able because I felt so, um, well, I was only looking at one side of myself, I wouldn't have been able to say that, you know what, Helen, I, I feel really small sometimes. Um, you know, I feel, um, I, I feel guilty when I've got success. I feel guilty when I've got failures. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could not have admitted stuff like that publicly. Like, who wants to admit that? Oh, yeah. gosh, you know, oh, how embarrassing, you know. But, but that, that's me, right? That authentically is me. And, and, and I say again, until we can authentically accept both sides of ourselves, it's like you say, um, you know, look at nature. Nature has seasons. Nature has night and day, you know, flood and famine. Um, you know, why, why do we think we're any different? Yeah. Yeah, we're not. And I'm the same as you. I couldn't have done my podcast 10 years ago. I was a different person. And, mm. uh, you know, that upbringing that we had that, you know, you go to school, you get a good job, you buy a house, you get married, you live happily ever after, right? Yeah, that's nice. And that has happened to, to some extent. But that inner fulfilment for me is just the journey that I've been on. And I'm still on that journey of self-discovery. So 
that leads in nicely to my next question. <laughs> what are some of the best places to start a journey into, I, I call it self-love, self-compassion and self-acceptance. So what are your thoughts on that? And if someone was listening to this today and they're relating to what we're saying about wearing a mask and not being an authentic self, what tips can you give them where to start? Yes, I think <laughs> The first thing is just radical self-honesty. You know, in that moment, saying to yourself, yeah, I'm angry, or yeah, that cheesed me off, or God, I can't stand my sister-in-law. You know, she pushes my buttons. You know, well, oh, I can't say that about my family. Whatever oh. it might be, in the moment, that, that radical self-honesty and acceptance of that, not judging yourself, you know, that's the key thing, right? Oh, hey, you know, you can't say that. Oh, gee, you're not a very nice person if you, if you, you know, if you feel that. Well, you're just a human being if you feel that. Yeah. You know, and and I think a lot of the time because we have those layers of masks and that, that mask in place, we don't acknowledge that. We don't acknowledge we don't like the sister-in-law or we're going to the Sunday family roast dinner, whatever it might be, oh. because you don't want to be seen as a you know a, a non-dutiful son or daughter or a a bad family member. And so that being okay with being imperfect, I think is really, really important. Um, uh, yeah, so you've touched on something there about going to the, the family functions and the events. And mm. I know that a lot of people go out of obligation or mm. fear, fear of rejection from one mm. family member, whether that be a parent or someone, that if, if I don't go, what are they going to say? But you go and you're miserable. Yes. yes. Right? So, you know, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I have, you know, I'm youngest of six, so I have lots of experience in this area. <laughs> I'm a big family. And, um, you know, the, the dream was always a big, one big happy family. You know, what a crock. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, you get so Christmas and there'd be 50 people there, right? Yeah, I want to fly. I can relate. I can relate. <laughs> how, can, how, can, how can you have 50 individuals together and there not be issues, right? Human <laughs> beings just aren't like that. And and, and so here's, here's the thing, um, and, and this gets back to honesty. You know, do I really want to go? Do I really want to host 50 people at Christmas? That's what I used to do. It was a horrible lot of work. I mean, I enjoyed parts of it, but it was a lot of work leading up. It was a lot of work afterwards. And I just said one, and I did it for years. And I just said one day, am I enjoying this? No. Am I going to do it anymore? No. And I just, I told people, I felt sick in the stomach telling people, my family, I'm not hosting it anymore. I'm not doing it. Oh. And, you know, I, the, the parts of ourselves wants to go, well, gee, aren't you being selfish? It's only once a year. You know, your mind's going, don't be so selfish. God, you're not a very nice person. And you're being selfish. Um, yes, I am. It's my life. Yeah. You know, so what, what's the alternative? You either, um, you either, you know, piss yourself off or you piss oh. someone else off. I mean, John D, Dr. John D. Martini, he calls it the law of lesser pisses. Um, you know, you're, like you're, yeah, you're far better off pissing other people off oh. than pissing yourself off because it's your life. It's not their life. Oh. <gasps> they won't like you. <gasps> they'll, they'll call you selfish. Well, it's my life, right? What, oh. what, why, why, why are we so conditioned? Why are we so afraid not to stand in our power and have that sovereignty? Yes, me not turning up may piss you off. It doesn't mean I love you any less. If you want to interpret it that way and be all this victim, well, so be it. But law of lesser pisses, right? Oh. And, <laughs> and you're and, better off pissing someone else off than yourself. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to look up his book. Um, the, the other thing about the selfish is that it, it is in, in institutionalised in our minds from a very young age that mm. if we don't conform to someone else's thoughts, um, you know, what they perceive should happen in that environment, then we're being selfish. But why are we being selfish? We're not. We're being true to self and yes. that's being self-full. And mm. we should be teaching our kids to be self-full, not arrogant and not at the detriment of others, but self-full to allow yourself to feel, uh, to feel full and to live a full life. Because this compliance and this obligation expectations is a lot, I think, of 
what gives us that inner dialogue of, well, should I, shouldn't I? Yeah, I know I'm not happy. I don't want to do it. But then am I being selfish? All that um, monologue that goes on inside our mind. So living a self-full life and making choices that fill up you and fill up your cup, I think, is, for me, that's something that I have started doing and it's it's so rewarding. And, yes, I, I still feel guilty and shameful and fearful when I say no to things that I really don't want to go to. But then once I've made the decision and I've committed to it and I've said no, I feel so much better. And they don't, most of the time, they don't care if you're there or not. They do get over it. And it doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means I don't want to go to that event. Mm. Helen, how selfish of you. Oh, I know. You're not a very nice person. Oh, goodness me. Yeah. So that can cause a lot of stress. Yeah. That is one area that can cause a lot of stress. And other areas where we get stressed is also that self-dialogue of Mm. um, projecting expectations on if I do that, this will happen. What are some tips for dealing with stress? Yeah, look, it's like I always say, the answer always lies within. And what I guess what I mean by that, there's... um, um, you know, just on a very basic level, understand that words are spells. Now, I'm not saying you delve into witchcraft or anything like yeah. that, but the, the, the words that we say in here mm-hmm. reverberate out into our world. The words that we say here reverberate out into our world. So, uh, you know, the power is within. Start with what words are you saying to yourself? Oh, I'm always like, oh, I'm clumsy or whatever. Even just little things like that. Oh. What are you? Because the thing is that in every second of every day, we are the creators of our world. Yeah. And so I would, I would challenge you know, anyone listening, the words you use, what are you spelling into the world, into yeah. your world? By the words you think, the words you say, what is going out into the, the energetic field there? Yeah. That you are creating mm. so that's the first thing right you cannot be free um and and free emotionally if you are putting yourself down you know words are spells it's a re- it's a really powerful thing to remember and you know take an inventory of of the words that you're saying to yourself yeah because it, it, it can make a huge difference absolutely and it's funny because once you start, once I started noticing the words that I said, because I had a coach help me with this years and years ago, it's amazing when you stop, focus and listen to the words you think and the words you say, there's patterns in there. Yes. And you will pick up on those patterns. And so simple little things about I mustn't forget. I I very, I'm not going to say never, but I very <laughs> rarely, I very rarely use that anymore. Because if I say I mustn't forget, my mind's going to focus on forget, right? So now I say I must remember. I must remember to take that with me rather than I mustn't forget to pick that up or whatever. I must remember. And small little changes like that for me have made a massive difference. Yeah. I would add, I would add to that things like uh, words like could, should, um, you know, I must, I have to. You know, all of those things are very energetically, very heavy, obligatory kind of words. Mm. You know, so look look for where you're saying, oh, look, I've got to go and do this now or I should really do that. Mm. Should you? Or, or are you just choosing to? Is, or is it coming from a place of guilt or fear? Or expectation. Yeah. 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 So those words, I think that's a really good tip for dealing with stress is focus on your words and what you're saying to yourself um, and then notice the patterns. Yes. Um, because I say a lot on my podcast, and just if you know me as a person, with awareness comes choice. If you're not aware of these things, you can't do anything about yeah. it. But if you focus on your patterns or the words you're saying and then you want to make a change, you can because you're now aware of it yeah. and then you have choice. That, that's a really good point. I, I actually think there are three things for, for any sort of change. Well, you touched on the first one, awareness. You can't change something unless you're aware of it. So yeah. like us having conversations like this is a good way of raising awareness. And the second thing um, is, um, you know, to, to in the moment, so you're aware of something in the moment to pause and accept yes. or acknowledge that that's happened. Oh, there I go again with uh-huh. my obligation or my, um, my negative self-talk. So that's the second thing is, is accepting in the moment that you've said that or acknowledging that you've said that. And I think the third thing is then going manual, right? Now, a lot of our lives... 
um, is so emotionally, um, we're on autopilot, right? And then yeah. we just do things out of happen because we're busy and da, 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 and all of a sudden you get to the end of the day, the end of the week, and it's like, ugh. you know, we, we live so unconsciously. And so, you know, once we are aware of something, two, we've stopped and acknowledged that, yes, we are behaving that way, we are saying those things. The third thing is to go manual. Think of an automatic car, right? You put it in drive oh. and you just drive whereas if you go manual you have to actually pause and change gears and it's in that pausing and changing gears that actually we can change but it starts like you said at awareness got to be awareness of our um, our our words to ourselves for example oh. in the moment oh there i go again with my um could should must language the manual part how can i replace that i want to do that oh. I, I choose now to go and do x is a very different energy, frequency, vibration, whatever word you want to use it. Oh. So those three things, awareness, acceptance or acknowledgement, and then go manual on something is really, really important. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say awareness in the moment and manual because that spells aim. <laughs> yes, nice. Like and that. that's a good way for um, our listeners to remember, be aware and then in the moment catch what you're saying in the moment and then go manual, put it into, put yourself in gear. Yeah. Rather than just on automatic on drive. Um, I speak a lot about an acronym OCCE, not quite as good as AIM, but nearly. (laughs) And I say observe, observe your thoughts, observe Mm. them, then catch them and catch them and hold on to them. And, And are they working for me? Are they not working for me? If they're not, change them. So observe, catch, change. And then E for engage, like just engage differently. Even just the slightest little bit, you will engage differently once you observe and catch because you are now aware. So you observe, you catch, you change, and then you engage differently to affect a different outcome. But yeah. aim is much simpler. Like, you know, awareness um, in the moment, so pause and then go manual. Aim. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. Workshopping on the go here, right? Workshopping, yeah. that's how I might work. So. <laughs> um, Oh, okay, yeah, no, I was just going to say one other thing is um, just pause and just be, just you and your thoughts. No, no phone, no social media, no TV, no computer. You know, when was the last time, for instance, you just went and spent, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes in nature? Just sitting there, just being, just being with your thoughts, your feelings, you know, like instead of this, this rushing existence that we have where we've got to be here, we've got to do that. Duh, 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 duh. When was the last time you honestly just sat with yourself and got to know yourself and your thoughts and your feelings. A lot For a lot of people, that's whoa, hardly ever. You know, we get to the end of the day, have a few drinks or whatever it might be, then collapse into bed, then get up the next day and do it all again. Yeah. And that's one thing for me that I do do. I meditate every day now. Um, sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. But if I go for a walk on the beach, because I live near the beach, um, at the end of my walk, I'll just sit on the beach with no music nothing I'll just sit and observe the waves and the wind and the birds and if there's people on the beach what are they doing um and that is so I I can't even describe the the words that I get from doing that because then I can come back and I can get into work and I can be focused yeah because I've cleared out the cobwebs like I've I've swept the mind and so now I've got a clean house so that I can come back and, and work for it but if you had have asked me to do that 10 years ago, I would have said, don't be stupid, I don't have time, I'm too busy. Mm-hmm. Don't, can't you see how important I am and how busy mm-hmm. I am? <laughs> but the, taking the time to slow down helps you become not fast but be able to do more. Um, yeah. And look at your um, your words there, Helen. You know, I haven't got time, I'm too busy. What, what spell are you putting out into the yeah, universe? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. That's what I used to say. Yeah. Yeah. And Who so, hasn't said I'm too busy? Haven't got time. Yeah. I've said that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, but we sit down in front of the TV every night. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so there's always time to you can make time to do things that you value and feel are important. And our own self-care, self-compassion. So being so hard on ourselves and beating ourselves up and oh, I'm so stupid, we shouldn't have done that, blah, blah, blah. It's now if things don't go as I as I planned or as I thought they might, then I think, okay, well, what have I learned from that? It's, yeah. it's a really good point. Um, I, and I'll share this with you. I, I don't know. Let's go six weeks ago. It might have been earlier. It might have been sooner. It might have been later. I sent a, 
um, an email to my list with a picture of um, a Tibishina jasmine bush that was in flower out in the back of our place. And um, the message of, of that email was that um, nature is imperfect and impermanent and so are we. And the thing with that is I took a close up of about four different flowers, you know, so if you, you I took a far away image and a close up image from afar, the, the, it was just beautiful, the beautiful um, pinky purpley flowers, it was just, it was just, you know, nature at its finest kind of thing. And then I took photos of the flowers and one of them had four petals, another one had five petals, one of them had three petals, one of them was curled up like it, nature is imperfect. Oh. Here's the thing, right, us human beings, we are part of nature. We can't get out of nature. We live in nature. We're, we're you know, captive, we're captive of the seasons, as it were. Um, and yet what we try and do is we try and control every darn thing in our lives. We try and make every darn thing perfect. And yet in doing that, we are going against nature because nature is imperfect and impermanent. Nature has her seasons. You know, not everything is summer where everything is fun. Sometimes it's winter and cold and dark. Yeah. You know, nature has these rhythms and seasons and nature is imperfect in those rhythms and seasons. And yet here we are, we fight this um, pointless battle, frustrating battle, stress-filled battle with ourselves to be perfect. And, you know, I would challenge anyone listening to this, just do this to for your own benefit. Go and have a look at a, a, a blossom in flower, a tree in flower or a shrub in flower. Go and have a look at a tree and look at its gnarly bark and how straight and beautiful some branches are and how gnarled and awful some other branches are and, and just just observe because when you see it with your own eyes you kind of oh, actually i get it yeah you know there, there is a massive lesson from nature about the impermanence and imperfection out there yeah you spoke earlier about you know sometimes you walk into a room and you can feel small and that mm. you've experienced self-doubt um so you know, people could look at you and, and, and say, oh, you're so lucky and you've, you've done this and you've done that and you've got a fantastic career. So you've experienced self-doubt in the past. How have you answered um, that, that little voice inside your head that might say, well, who am I to do this? Who am I to write a book? Who am I to be a coach or whatever, a marketing writer and things like that? So how do you answer that voice in your head that might pop up or does it still pop up? Or Well, the, the last time... I experienced that little voice in my head was about 45 minutes ago, just before we got on the call. <laughs> and it was saying those same things. Gee, you better be on point today. Gee, are you sure you're the right person for Helen and her group? Gee, you know, you better make sure it's a really good job. You know, why aren't you doing something? Like I had all of those things. Gee, what if it, what if it doesn't work out well? Gee, what if you look silly? What if you're, in, you, you know, you, you don't do a good job for these people. I had all of those things oh. going on in my head. And um, every time I speak in front of people, every time I run a workshop, I have all of those things going on inside my head. Oh. And one of the things I take comfort from is I'll go back to David Hawkins in his book, Letting Go, is that, you know, everybody secretly harbors the fear that they are dumb, ugly, oh. unlovable and a failure. Oh. Um, so if I can, how I guess to, to answer it directly, how I overcome that is I just accept that's part of me. Yeah, and I also, I also accept um, the fact that if I just turn up and be me, that is enough. Yeah, yeah, and that is so powerful because I, I just think, well, I'm giving you me and my best, and that's enough. And if it's not the right thing for you, that's okay. You don't yeah. have to accept it. You don't have to be part of it. You can just ignore it and walk away. But if you resonate with it and you want to be part of the tribe and we can get together and lift each other up, then jump on board. So, mm. but again, 10 years ago, I wasn't that person. Mm. 10 years yeah, ago, I, I wanted you to like me. I really wanted you to like me. Agreed. And, yeah. and for me, 10 years ago, I would have had 300 pages of notes and I would have had slides to show you and everything would have been structured and boom, 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 boom. It would have... Um, it would have um, you know, all been this wonderful presentation of, well, oh, gee, that was so polished and nice. Um, but it also would have been inauthentic in some ways. Yeah. You know, whereas like, if, if we've got time, Helen, I'll just give you this one, one more example. Yeah. I, one of the things that I do is I, with my poetry, I go to local poetry slams. And so, you know, you get up in front of 50, 100 people and, and read out your poetry. Now, 
I've spoken at stages all around the country. I've spoken to big groups of people. I was a teacher for 20 years. So standing up and talking in front of people um, is not difficult for me per se, you know, and, and hopefully this has been um, useful for people and I've been articulate and all those sorts of things. But one of the things that I found, and because this gets back to when did I feel self-doubt? So the very first time about well, six months ago now, I did my first live poultry performance. It was about 120 people in the room. And I got, you know, yeah, I've got this. I've done this speaking before. I got up there and oh, it, was, it was kind of embarrassing because I realised my legs were actually shaking. I had to hold, really concentrate to hold my paper still. And, I, and I'm going, look, what the hell's going on here? Like, and anyway, I got through the poem and everyone clapped and I sat down and I, I was I was really thrown by that experience. And I'm driving home and um, I, I, I kind of, what I, the conclusion I came to was that because it was like my whole body was kind of shaking that I managed to just hold it together long enough. It was it was weird. I'm, I'm in my mid fifties and I'm I'm coming apart on stage where I never have in you know in the past. And and I think what the thing was, um, I realised that a lot of my speaking and so forth um, and my workshops have all been like I said very structured and ordered, and they've all come from oh. my mind to get people from one point to another. When I was sharing poetry, which comes from the heart, my goodness, that was an incredibly vulnerable place to be. And it, 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 it dug up more stuff from my shadow where I still needed to be liked, obviously, even though I've done all the work, I still needed to be liked. I didn't want to be embarrassed. All of that stuff is really, really deep. And, and part of my stuff too is I have to be a high achiever, right? I, I got recognition and love by being a high achiever. And if I, if I don't get, I'm not a high achiever, don't get the award, then I'm not loved. My oh. self-worth was very tied to my achievement. And so going to this, and I've done it four or five times since then, I've made myself go and do this, get up and I don't shake as much as I did the first time, but putting myself in a vulnerable position, which was a relatively safe space, you know, because it was a very encouraging environment. Um, but yeah, I still get things like that that come up, even though I've done all the work, I've been to South America, been to the Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. You know, because I'm a human being, I still have those things. And I just, at the end of the day, I just accepted, okay, yeah, I was, I was, re <laughs> I was really um, vulnerable then. And it was a really difficult thing. And, I guess it got me thinking too more that you know, a lot of people say, well, I've gone and done the course, gone to the seminar, that should be fixed now. Um, and my take on that is, is that, well, you know, gee whiz, we shower every day, we cook every day in the kitchen. Oh. Why is my personal development any different? Why we accept those things, right? But because I've gone to a seminar, or read a book, I shouldn't have to deal with that stuff anymore. And so that whole experience of being vulnerable in front of people um, and me shaking <laughs> almost uncontrollably, um, you know, was a, a, a beautiful learning experience for me because it realized that I've still, it made me realize that I've still got a lot of work to do in my shadow, you know, with, yeah. with that achievement being tied or my self-worth rather being a tied to achievement. So I've been looking a lot of that at that um, since that um, since that episode. So yeah, I still get those that little voice in my head. And and all of us have it. It it mm -hmm. might not be with um, attachment to achievement being equal to love, but we will all have deep inside of us in our unconscious mind the association that this means that for me. Yes. And it's, it's come from a very early age, from, mm. but we don't know because it's unconscious and it's back there, but we know how we respond as an adult to a certain situation, but we're not really sure why we respond that way to that situation. Um, so doing the work and you showing yourself through your poetry was you really giving your a bit of yourself to everyone, which can be scary because, yes. uh, you know, it's not taking them on a journey from here to here in a normal training environment. It's sharing um, with the audience but going back to that quote that I quoted at the beginning from your book that if you want to find true freedom to find you then you're invited to take a journey into your shadow self that one of your readers wrote about your finding new book that in and of itself says a lot about what they experienced in reading the book so what is it that you think causes your um, readers to uh, evoke such a heartfelt response yeah it's, 
It's a really interesting question because I didn't, when I, I started, I've written poetry many, many, for many, many years. Um, and when I, so the, the, the start of the book, it wasn't meant to be a book, right? I just, my, for whatever reason, I just got messages to start writing poems. And I, I, I did that and I, I very tentatively, I showed them to one or two people and they went, oh, wow, that really, that really kind of hit me here. Like I really felt that. I felt that what you're saying there, I, I could really feel it. And, you know, when you when you you show one or two people and you get that response, well, yeah, it can be a bit of a hit and miss. Yeah, okay, well, they're just being nice or whatever it might be. Um, but the more people I showed things to, the more went, they went, wow, that really, that really, I really felt that. And um, you've got to publish this stuff. And I'm going, I'm not doing that. I'm like, gosh, how embarrassing. No, I'm not doing that, you know. <laughs> um, and, and people just... You know, like that. When people say things like "that made me cry," mm. um, you know that that's well, okay. If that made you cry, maybe it, it and, and helps you look within. Maybe that will um, help someone else. And I think it's getting back to that being vulnerable. Like it was the the fact that it was, I guess, so so raw, so heartfelt, as opposed to being intellectual. Because I've got a a fairly strong intellectual mind, and so me overcoming that and writing from the heart was I guess the difference that that's the only I don't have an intellectual answer for that other than that's what I think it is um, because oh. it's a, a different thing from from that that headspace it was a heart space thing yeah yeah well you've done some amazing work I've read so many reviews about your book finding you and I haven't read it yet but I am going to purchase oh, my okay. copy so I can Excellent. read it um so what's happening for you now Yep, that's it there. Yes. <laughs> um, What's okay. next for you? Tell me yeah. about what you're focusing on. Um, so I'm focusing on accepting that I'm just like nature, that I am imperfect. And I, I must say that that has been um, an incredibly liberating thing for me because I don't beat myself up as much anymore. And so that, to me, that's a daily ongoing thing um, of just, yep, I'm going to, you know, and so uh, just a quick example, if this was this happened 10 years ago, I would have got off this call and gone, oh, I didn't mention that. I should have said that. Why did I say that? You know, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I now know that whatever I've said are the things that people who were listening needed to hear. Um, yeah. So I don't beat myself up. So that's the, the thing about being imperfect. Um, the, the other thing is that um, I'm continuing to, to look within. I continue to have my just be moments. Um, I continue to work on my shadow, but I'm also, um, I've got another book in the pipeline. I'm not going to say what that is just yet. Um, and oh, we um, can have you back on. <laughs> yes, oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah. Um, and I'm also um, creating some programs that will be launching soon. So, and again, I don't want to say too much about them right at this moment Fantastic. because there's nothing in, there's nothing in, um, ready to be um, let go yet so okay yeah. that's fantastic it's very exciting I can't wait to see what programs you're releasing and um and and the new book so to finish today with uh for our audience mm -hmm. in one sentence what advice would you give to someone who is maybe feeling a little bit lost or overwhelmed or just lacks confidence and wants to find it know that you're not alone you're not broken you're just yeah. human you know yeah, that, that's perfect. the because oh. because here's the thing this is two or three sentences but here's the thing right when when we are hurting when in that moment we feel small or petty or we feel like we're being selfish we, we don't feel good about ourselves because those emotions are uncomfortable when we feel that it can feel very isolating you know and and that mental loop can start and get worse because emotions start start the thought right sorry thoughts start the emotion right oh i'm terrible i'm terrible and then i feel terrible um, you know, so that to me is the big thing is to know that you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You are human and you are having a human experience and you are unwinding in your imperfection, your human experience. So there, yeah. was, there, was, there was 35 sentences, apologies there. That's okay. That's <laughs> fine. That, 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 that was a really beautiful way to put it. And, and the other thing is we're not alone and we're not broken and mm. other people are going through it. Mm. And to actually talk to someone. Yeah. You know, because sometimes just speaking about how you're feeling is a weight off your shoulders. That it you can... releases energy. You're 100% yep. right. It releases you know. energy. Yeah. yeah. And, and so the other thing I would say, sorry to talk about no. the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, bravo to you for looking within and acknowledging that and, and doing something about it because most people out there 
have just got the mask in place and go through life on autopilot, right? And the same yeah. thing this year as they did last year, the year before, data. So good on you for looking in. You're more power to you. Um, you know, wonderful. I acknowledge you for doing that. Yeah, and, and and they should be proud of themselves if they're if they're able to acknowledge and see that they're caught in a loop or that they're caught in these patterns of words or that they're just in a moment that they just don't feel good. Mm. And that's okay. That's well, okay. You're just, yep, just feel through it because mm. you might that storm will pass. So mm. you might be in the middle of that storm, but storms don't stay forever. That storm will pass. The rain will ease. The sun will come out, and you will see a rainbow. Yeah, one of when we're in the middle of the ayahuasca ceremonies in the you know in South America, they're, they're really difficult, right? Because you're purging a lot, as in oh. physically vomiting. And one of the the mantras of that thing, of the that experience is doesn't matter how bad it gets, this too shall pass. Yeah, yeah. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. I think that's a beautiful way to end today's podcast. Uh, I will put all of the links to Steve's socials in the show notes. But, Steve, where can people find you? Yeah, sure. If you go to stevevincentonline.com or if you wanted to order a copy of that book, if you're at the book, if you're in Australia, it's findingyoubook.com.au. And I'm, I'm happy to sign it for you um, and ship it off to you within a couple of days of the order happening. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how you can find it. Or Instagram is stevevincent underscore underscore. Okay. Uh, Mm. Lovely. And I'll put all those links in. Um, and I will also uh, just advise the listeners that if they go to your website, they can download a most beautiful, beautiful poem. Yeah, so it's in a poster format. And mm. I strongly recommend that everyone pop across to your website and download that poem. I'm not going to say any more about it, but it's <laughs> worth getting. It is definitely worth getting. Thank you. Um, so we'll end there. Thank you very much, Steve, for being a guest on the podcast today. And I hope that we will have you back again when you've launched your programs and your new book. Thanks, Helen. I'd love to come back. Bye for now. <laughs>